which those at the top of that pyramid know all about and they know who they are. And in the Sumerian tablets they actually taught, remember 1850 they were found, 2000 BC apparently they were uh, buried but they tell the story going back way before 2000 BC. They talk about how the first interbreeding between these gods and humanity was done by what we call today test tube methods, excuse me. We would think that was ludicrous according to official history and in 1850 it would have sounded completely lunatic. Except we're doing it now. And all around the world, like I say, you find um, this same recurring theme of uh, gods interbreeding with humanity. Now, in, a, in Africa over the last literally few months, I've had a long series of meetings and talks with a Zulu shaman called Credo Mutwa. Uh, he's the one on the left, by the way. Right. Credo Mutwa is 78 years of age. He's been initiated into the highest levels of the African shamanist extreme. And his level, known as a Sanusi, only two exist now in southern Africa. He's one, his aunt's the other, and she's 90 years of age. Which is why when I started hearing this guy speak, I immediately hired a film crew and did hours and hours of interviews with the guy, because he's stunning in terms of the knowledge that he has and the knowledge we have to hear. And I, I produced two videos, Reptilian uh, Agenda 1 and 2, um, which are Credo Mutwa's knowledge, stunning because this knowledge had to be preserved, and it wasn't going to be. I first met him in 1998, and we talked about the Illuminati for hours, and also about the extraterrestrial connection to the Illuminati. <clears throat> and then this time, in August, we talked at greater length about more detail of what he knew, because the biggest secret had come out by then, and he'd read it, and he felt able to unleash and reveal to me far more than he did before. Credo Mutwa, 78 year old Zulu shaman, tells the same story, the same recurring story of how a race from the stars that probably started out on earth um, a long long time ago interbred with humanity creating hybrid bloodlines. And he has many artifacts, ancient artifacts, which um, have been passed down to him through the initiation stream. And one of them is, um, is this. Um, let me just go back one. There you go. It's a necklace, although it's not really a necklace, that's what it's called. It goes on his shoulders and picking it up, my goodness me, it's a real struggle, it's so heavy. It's called the Necklace of the Mysteries. And it's documented to be at least 500 years old. It was been mentioned in, 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 in that period of time. And he reckons it's at least a thousand years old. And this necklace of the mysteries has hanging from it a series of symbols which tell the story of the African history. And hanging from the front is an extraterrestrial with a big willy and hanging facing him is an earth woman and how can I put it, these two fit together and this is the symbol, the symbolic expression of this constantly recurring theme of the interbreeding which produced the hybrid race and Credo Mutwa says too that this, these crossbreed bloodlines became the ruling royal lines with the divine right to rule. This is a closer up one. Um, the, um, the Big Willie is now copper, but Credo says the original, before it was stolen and they had to replace it, was gold. And look at what is at the heart of ancient Egyptian myth the golden penis of Osiris. Again, the repeating theme of that in Central and Southern um, Africa. This is the extraterrestrial figure and I asked the obvious question, uh, did they really look like that? And he said no. 
but for reasons that we'll come to um, in a little while, these gods, he said, according to African tradition, um, said anyone that depicts us as we really look will be instantly killed. And so the people had to start using symbolic ways of depicting the gods to show they were not human while not depicting them exactly as they looked. And this is one way that they, they did it. Um, on the other side um, from him is an earth woman there. And um, I used to go out with someone like that, you know. Yeah, story of my bloody life, that is. And also hanging from the necklace is this. It's a flying saucer, we would call it today. There's the top, and that goes down. It's not easy to take a shot of this in the African sunlight, but that goes down as a mirror image of that. It's what we call a flying saucer today. This thing is at least 500 years old. He reckons at least 1,000. And he said that these um, ships were not what this Chittahuri these gods came in, the, they came, he said, according to the African tradition, in vast ships, and these came out of the ships to move around the earth. This is the hand that um, hangs from the necklace, and there is the eye, the all-seeing eye. And I said to him, obviously, what is that? He said, that is representative of the Watchers. Now, the Watchers was an ancient um, Egyptian and many other um, peoples in that area description of these gods. And you'll see as we go along the tremendous um, symbolism of the eye to the Illuminati um, in their symbolism that's all around us today. And there is Orion, the constellation of Orion, which according to um, uh, African uh, legend and uh, the knowledge that's been passed over through this shamanistic stream was one key area where these gods actually came from. On the back of the necklace is a depiction of the earth. The Zulus, and Credo is the official historian and storyteller of the Zulu nation. The word Zulu actually means people from the stars. They believe they are a royal bloodline from another world. And they knew all that time ago that the earth was not flat. If you look, uh, as Credo talks about on, on the videos, if you look at the Zulu word for time and the Zulu word for space, they are virtually identical because they've known for goodness knows how many centuries and beyond that time and space were the same thing. And we think that they are a primitive people. Where did that knowledge come from? Have a guess. So around the ancient world, Again, this is the, the Hindu culture. You find in the Vedas and these other um, texts and legends stories of these high-tech gods warring in the sky and bringing knowledge to humanity of various kinds. So this is the area here from which this, say, uh, this uh, story seems to have emerged of global control. Caucasus Mountains seems to be very, very important. It keeps coming up in relation to many things, not least one of the origins of what we call today the white race. And it's interesting that in North America they call white people Caucasian. Why do they call them after some mountains in the Near East? Because whoever coined the phrase knew a lot more than he was telling. And it comes down including Turkey, down what we now call Syria, Israel, Egypt, and round encompassing Iran and Iraq. Now these bloodlines these hybrid bloodlines were seeded all over the planet and they worked through all races. I'll get more into that um, in a little while, what exactly they are. But it's out of this area that the key lines came which have manifested today as those who run the planet in banking, politics, business, etc. And out of this area of the world, people's overwhelmingly white peoples came in various ways across land 
to take over um, in Europe. They went by sea earlier than that round to Britain. And what you find is that the key symbols of Britain and British culture and of Scotland, England, Ireland, Wales did not originate in these islands at all. They all come from North Africa because that's where the people came that brought that knowledge. And within these peoples, particularly within the white race, were these particular bloodlines that again and again, as you'll see, manifested as those in aristocratic, royal and ruling power. Before we get into that, let's just look at some of the knowledge that the elite of that ancient time had and the elite of modern times also have. One key area of knowledge that this elite have held all this time is the true nature of the sun. All through this period we're talking about, there have been two levels of knowledge in everything. If you read the religious texts, like the Bible and other religious texts, as an initiate of numerology, of the Illuminati codes, etc., you read the text in a certain way and you see what it's really symbolically saying. If you're not initiated into that knowledge, and most people aren't obviously, you read the same text and you are encouraged to take the symbolic literally. So, the same piece of text can be a means of passing on knowledge through initiates and creating prison religions and prison histories for the masses. And in the ancient world, the sun was the same, it still is today. The mass of the people focused on the sun because of its obvious effect on their daily lives, their crops, their lives, heat, warmth, light. But at that level of initiation, which had been passing on this ancient knowledge, they knew the sun was far more than that. They knew that the sun was and is still, of course, an incredible generator of energy that is affecting life on earth second by second. And that these cycles of emissions of energy from the sun can be predicted very precisely the sun cycles. And at their peak, some of the energy that's projected from the sun and comes to the earth on the solar wind has taken out computer systems, has taken out power systems. And when we get towards the end of the evening, you'll see the most incredible, astonishing coincidence between the sun and the very point of the false Gregorian calendar created millennium that's now very close. The Illuminati know and have always known that everything is energy. They just don't want us to know that. And that when the sun is in certain cycles, the energy it's projecting at the earth affects the earth's field and affects fundamentally human energy fields operating within the earth's field. And if you know how that human consciousness is going to be most affected by these cycles, you know when to play your cards. Now, people are, who are investigating the political and financial manipulation, but are into none of this stuff, in fact they think it's the devil, they have identified, even at that level of research, that there are certain key times when the Illuminati play many cards and then there's a more fallow period and then they'll go again. What they're doing is playing the astrological solar and lunar cycles so that the, the effect they want from humanity is most likely to happen because the energy situation is most primed for it to happen. They don't announce things and introduce things and play their cards willy-nilly. Oh, should we play a card today? Should, should we have that terrorist bomb? Should we have it today tomorrow? Absolutely. On the, on the button of the astrological solar and lunar best time to do it. And these things are sunspots. 
some of these arcs of energy, projections of energy from the sun apparently, are 100,000 miles high. And there's a guy called Maurice Cottrell, some people here may have read his books, who earlier on in his life studied sunspot cycles, these cycles of energy projections from the sun. And he worked them into small cycles, medium cycles and great cycles. Later on in his life he came across the measurements of time left us by the Maya people in the Yucatan in Central America. Uh, one of their great cycles is due to end in just a few years time, 2012. And he realized that these measurements of time of the Maya, small, medium and great cycles, were astonishingly in sync, even over the thousands of year cycles, with these sunspot cycles. He also found that the rise and fall of great civilizations like the Roman Empire could be seen to have been in line with the solar cycles. So in the ancient world, there was the knowledge of all this there in the hands of the few, passed over through initiation, and then there was the masses, most of whom did not have this knowledge. So, in the ruling royal lines of various civilizations, the sun was a massive focus and gold became the solar metal. This is the uh, 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 part of the uh, collection of Tutankhamun, the son of Akhenaten in Egypt. This is Rome, again the sun, and the lion became symbolic of the sun. And as we get through the evening, you'll see just how obsessed the Illuminati are to the point where it takes your breath away with ritual and with symbolism. Everything is ritual and symbolism to them, everything. And because of the mane of the lion, that symbolized the rays of the sun, and so the lion became symbol of the sun. So it became the king of the jungle, the royal animal, the king of the solar system. And the sun is 99% of the mass of this solar system. It is the solar system. When it changes, we friggin change. This is Sri Lanka, again, gold, the sun. And this is more recent. This is the sun chair of George Washington, the first Freemasonic, massively high Freemasonic president of the United States. Of the 56 signatories to the American Declaration of Independence, 50 were known Freemasons, only one was known not to be. And what you start to realize as you get into this research is the Freemasons uh, and most Freemasons don't know their arse from their elbow in terms of what, what that organization is being used for, by the way. If we start throwing generalizations, it's the Freemasons, it's the this, it's the that, we've lost the plot. This, this, this is an organization working within organizations. The Freemasonic Network is one of them. You start to realize that the Freemasons did not start in the 1600s, as we're told. That's when that particular mask on a face that can be taken back to the ancient world, to Babylon and beyond. Use the name Freemasonry. Everything that Freemasonry uses in its ritual, everything, can be charted back to ancient Babylon and beyond. That's where they come from. It's just another name. Now this is a, a symbol in the Illuminati secret language that comes up very often. In ancient Egypt, they symbolized the sun in its daily cycle. They symbolized the sun at the start of its cycle as the sun rose above the horizon as Horus, the son of God of Egypt, from which we get the word horizon. And at the end of that daily cycle, as the sun went down into the dark place, as they said, they symbolized the sun at that point as the negative force in Egyptian myth, Set. This is why we get sun set. So in Illuminati terms, and you'll see, you might see this symbol used by people who haven't got a clue what, what the Illuminati use it for, but in Illuminati terms, whenever you see that, that symbolizes Horus, the son of God of Egypt, and you'll see that come up through the evening. Now, the focus on the sun in the ancient world was massive, and from it has come so many things that have imprisoned people by the creation of prison religions through taking the symbolic literally. And we've been encouraged to do that. 
This is a symbol the ancients used <coughs> to symbolize the cycle of the sun through the year, or the cycle of the earth in relation to the sun, to be more accurate, I guess. Um, they drew a circle and they put the signs of the zodiac around it. Zodiac coming from a Greek word meaning animal circle appropriately. They then broke the circle up into uh, four, the four seasons, very good pop group in the 60s by the way. Cool, we've got a few, got a few of my age in here. Anyone below my age is going, what's he talking about, the Pratt, four seasons, never heard of him. Frankie Valley. he used to sing as if someone was grabbing something rather tightly, do you remember? Very high. Anyway, they then drew a cross across the circle and they put a sun on the cross. Now, I've heard that somewhere before. Where have I heard that? I can't remember. Anyway, at this point in the cycle is the winter solstice, December 22nd. At that point, the ancients used to say symbolically in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun had died. It had reached the lowest point in its cycle. Three days later, they said, the sun had demonstrably started its journey back to the peak of its power in the summer. And so, on December the 25th, three days after the winter solstice, they said the sun was born or born again. And if you go back into the pre-Christian world, you will find a stream of deities who were born to virgin mothers and all that died to save the sins of humanity who were born on December the 25th because they were symbolic of the sun and other esoteric uh, symbolic themes and concepts and not literal people. Some were even given gold, frankincense and myrrh. In ancient Babylon, where the Illuminati had their power base in the ancient world, where they created and perfected the blueprint of control by religion, they worshipped three deities. One was called Nimrod, who they symbolized as a fish. One was called Tammuz, and under, under other names too, the son of Nimrod, and they said uh, that Nimrod and Tammuz, father and son, were one. Am I in church or what? I'm giving a sermon. And the female element of the Babylonian trinity was Queen Semiramis, who this symbolizes the dove. That will become very relevant as we move into the modern world. What they said about Tammuz, the son of God in ancient Babylon, was that he died to save the sins of humanity in effect. And when they killed him, they put him in a tomb. And they rolled a rock across the front. And three days later, when they rolled the rock back, Tammuz had gone. And this is what they don't tell you on stars on Sunday. Are these stars on Sunday still going? Songs of bloody praise then, whatever they have on the BBC every Sunday, you know, I don't know. Never mentioned that, do they? Funny that. Anyway, as the sun um, entered in this ancient symbolism, the sign of the ram or the lamb at um, Easter, they used to sacrifice lambs to the gods because they thought the gods would look kindly on them if they did so. Hence we have the ancient theme of the lamb dying and shedding blood to save humanity. And of course, when we reach the peak of the, in the summer, the sun was at its peak of its power, which brings me to another story. It's a lovely example of how the symbolic has been taken literally. One of the things the ancients used to do is symbolize the uh, yearly cycle of the sun as the life of a man. They would symbolize the sun um, at December the 25th as a baby. He would grow up and then at the summer solstice, the peak of the sun's power, they would depict the sun as a man who was immensely strong with long golden hair, symbolic of the rays of the sun being at their fiercest and greatest at that point. As the sun came down into um, the autumn and entered the house of Virgo the Virgin, the house of Delilah, they used to depict the sun man having his hair get shorter as the rays of the sun got less and less powerful. 
And then round here he was depicted like we depict old father time. But of course what I've just told is the story of Samson. Sam son, Sam the son, which we're then told to take literally and whole bloody religions come out of it. Now this symbol in itself is not negative at all, it's just a symbol, it just symbolizes something. <clears throat> but because of the focus on the son of the Illuminati, because of their understanding, it became part of the Illuminati secret language and we start to see it around us all the time when we realize it exists. You watch from now on. Um, that's what this is, the Celtic cross. It's the circle and the cross. I took that in a graveyard in Ireland and that's what this is. The obsession with symbolism and ritual is just incredible. You'll see that. I mean, it'll get more and more astonishing as the evening come, go, goes along. Just what's in our face around us all the time, which we haven't seen. Um, but the um, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is a wholly owned subsidiary and the creation of the Illuminati. It's being more and more manipulated, as you know, you can see in my books years ago and many other people's books too. It's being manipulated to become the world police force, the world army. That's what Bosnia and Kosovo is about. And there's the symbol. This is the, um, this is the CIA in America. Again, the cross and the rays of the sun on the cross. This sun obsession because of their uh, knowledge of what the sun is doing. And now you can harness that energy and use it against as well as uh, for um, the people. Now, it even goes, and you'll see some amazing stuff about this as we go along, it even goes into the street plans of the major Illuminati cities. At this time, the operational level of manipulation, coordination, central point, is the city of London for reasons we'll come to. But Paris is also a major Illuminati center and always has been and that's why Diana died there in her ritual assassination. And here we have the center of the Paris street plan, the Arc de Triomphe and the arch is very much secret society symbolism. That's why we have the Royal Arch of Freemasonry. And you have the circle, it's called the Atolli Circle, the Star Circle and going off from there are 12 streets. It is that symbol again in the street plan of Paris. And in Paris they've even gone so far as to put the sun on the friggin' road. All around it. And when we get further into the evening you'll see just how obsessive this is and how it's in our face. And it's not just to take the piss. It's for, it's, it's for other reasons too. Um, reasons of resonating energy to a certain frequency. Now this is a picture I took in the city of London, the epicenter of operational um, manipulation of the planet uh, through these Illuminati networks. Um, this was formerly the uh, Financial Times building. It's now a financial operation. It's opposite St. Paul's Cathedral. Again, there's the zodiac circle and there's the sun on the center. And that face is actually supposed to be that of Winston Churchill. Very appropriate because Winston Churchill is one of the bloodlines, he's an offshoot of the Marlborough bloodline. And that's why Winston Churchill uh, was Prime Minister during the war. Amazing how simple history gets when you get behind the veil. Now some of the great initiates, some of them with a positive agenda, some of them with anything but, have manifested as uh, great writers and artists. According to a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, um, the artist Leonardo da Vinci, who painted this very famous picture, The Last Supper, was a grand master of a highly elite secret society, still going today, called the Priory of Sion, S-I-O-N. Interesting, in the Sanskrit language, which again very much goes back to these bloodlines in the ancient world, because if you look at conventional history even, never mind challenging alternative history, you find that it was, a, a, according to um, conventional history, a quote, Aryan race, a white race, that went out of the Caucasus Mountains area into the Indus Valley and took the stories that manifested as the Indus Valley culture. And in Sanskrit, the sun is called... No, it's not called that. 
called, it's called Siona, S-I-O-N-A. And for me, this elite secret society based in France, the Priory of Sion is actually the Priory of the Sun. Leonardo da Vinci was a grand master of it. So what he's done here is used this same symbol in his picture. He symbolized Jesus as the sun and the halo around the head is how the ancients used to depict their sun gods to show that their god was the sun. And he's broken up the twelve disciples into four sets of three. And that's why the guy's looking the other way there and there's the gap there too. The same symbol. And it's interesting, I mean, tell me, I mean, I'm looking for the answer here. Is there a universal law that says that every religious deity has to have 12 followers or 12 disciples? Because they all seem to have them. And we get King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, the Zodiac Circle. How many knights was that? Oh yeah, 12. The symbolism is all around us and if we get um, pulled into taking it literally, we're going to lose the plot big time, and we have. Again, many of the ancient deities used to be depicted with this around their head, symbolic of the sun. This is a Phoenician <coughs> standing stone found in Scotland, and this is their, their sun god, Bel. And there's the halo, depicting that Bel was in fact the sun. <clears throat> so let's start our journey um, across what we call history. Out of this ancient near and Middle Eastern area, where this phenomenal knowledge was and where these key bloodlines were seeded thousands and thousands of years ago, came overwhelmingly white peoples across land and they changed their name from time to time, but when you do the research and follow the language and other common themes, you find that they were simply different names for the same peoples. But this took time to go across land. Earlier than that, around 3000 BC or before, an advanced people, again a white race, from this area, who history calls the Phoenicians, went by sea around Spain and up into what we call today Britain. And they took the North African culture and parked it in the British Isles, it has become the British culture and of course, in its various forms, it's rapidly becoming the world culture. The Phoenicians have been marginalized by conventional history. Yes, the Phoenicians existed, now let's get on to something that really matters. They are fundamental to understanding so much. Phoenician artifacts have been found in North America. Thousands of years BC, they went there. They've been found in Brazil. They have been found in Queensland, Australia. And they worshipped a number of deities which are very significant. One of them was called Barat, the male, that became Baritan. And if you look in the Indus Valley, through here, in the other direction, you'll find a number of their gods were very close to the word Barat. The female deity of the Phoenicians was Barati. And Barati, when they came to the British Isles, became Britannia. They depicted the, the two, the English Britannia later and the Phoenician Barati, virtually the same, and the stories told about them were the same. They also, um, here in what we now call Turkey, what's called Cappadocia, the Phoenicians had another deity, George of Cappadocia, who when they came to Britain became St. George of England, who defeated the dragon, which is very symbolic and possibly very significant. And another deity the Phoenicians uh, had was called St. Michael, which eventually became, of course, a Christian deity. And it was in the west of England here that the Phoenicians arrived, first of all. And down there you'll find so many St. Michael uh, names used, like St. Michael's Mount down near Penzance. The earliest tin miners were the Phoenicians. And again, when you follow 
the flow of these peoples, you find that this knowledge from North Africa became the British culture. This is how the, uh, the British depict um, on, a, on an old penny Britannia. And this is a Phoenician coin with Bharati. There's that symbol again. And the stories they tell about both of them were virtually identical. This is a, a depiction of a uh, Phoenician high priestess. And on the garb they used to wear swastikas. People think that the swastika came with the Nazis. Not true. What the Nazis did was take this ancient esoteric symbol that can be found all over the world and they consciously turned it around to indicate the negative. It's what I call reverse or mirror symbolism. You take an esoteric symbol, which in itself is not negative at all, but you indicate the negative by reversing it or distorting it. And this is why the classic symbol for Satanism is the pentagram, the five-pointed star, reversed, pointing down. It indicates the negative consciously. Um, again, it, on a Phoenician stone found in Scotland, there we go, there's again the swastika. These are ancient esoteric symbols, which um, the Illuminati have known all about. Now, you know, I don't have to kind of mention this in this area, of course. The number of white horses there are across the hillsides of here in Western England, the chalk hillsides. This is, um, according to conventional history and archaeology, the oldest one at Uffington in Wiltshire, not far from Avebury, the Avebury Stone Circle. And it's been um, dated by conventional archaeologists at around 3000 BC. Just this window of time when it appears the Phoenicians were arriving here from North Africa. Why would the Phoenicians put white horses everywhere? Because the white horse was a major symbol of the Phoenician sun religion. So, we <clears throat> had these peoples moving across in various ways to people um, the European continent. But within these peoples were these particular genetic lines that did not have an outward appearance of being different, but were genetically different. And it's these lines that manifested as the aristocracy and the ruling families of these European peoples as they became. And they interbred incessantly to hold this genetic structure, and they still do today. There's another group of Phoenicians which will bring us into the modern world. They went to North Italy and eventually these Phoenicians became the Venetians who created a maritime and financial empire that was immensely powerful. Among the key families there was one called the De Medici family, one of the key ruling lines and families. The De Medici family were the sponsors of Leonardo da Vinci, the Grand Master of the Priory of Sion. And as the night unfolds, you'll see more and more of these threads start to connect. The ruling lines of the Venetians became known as the Black Nobility, because what they did was um, invent aristocratic titles for themselves and take over aristocratic titles that already existed, and they got this nickname, the Black Nobility. As time unfolded, the black nobility moved up, they stayed here, this is why northern Italy and Switzerland are major Illuminati centers today, but some number of these lines moved up into Europe, into Germany, into Holland, and eventually one of these lines called William of Orange crossed the channel and became King of England as William III in 1689. He arrived in 1688 and became King in 1689. What happened at that point is that he married Queen Mary and they ruled as William and Mary. Because of the obsession with symbolism and ritual of the Illuminati, what, that, what was happening there? It was the symbolic fusion of these bloodlines that had gone by sea and earlier to Britain with the bloodlines that had come in this direction. And from that point, London and Britain became the epicenter of Illuminati operations. In the ancient world, it was Babylon. 
Then it moved to Rome, and when, it, when the Illuminati were centered in Rome, that's when we had the Roman Empire. And then when they moved to London, what followed that was the British Empire, which was not the British Empire at, at all, I now understand. It was the empire of the Illuminati, these bloodlines that had centered themselves in Britain, which is a very different thing. In 1694, not long after he became king, it was William of Orange who signed the charter that created the Bank of England and the whole central banking system started to motor and emerge. So London became the epicenter. And through the British Empire, particularly the British Empire, but the other European empires as well. These bloodlines, this genetic structure that only they knew about until now, was exported all over the world, into the Americas, North, Central, South America, into Australia, into Africa, into Asia, as far as China, New Zealand. And people can go this far with me, and then they say, well, hold on a minute, I could follow you this far, mate. But those empires don't exist anymore, so it must be all over then. Not quite. This is a vital point to understand in this manipulation. There's two types of control. There's a control which has a finite life, and there's a control that can go on forever until someone exposes it. The first is a dictatorship you can see, touch, and taste. Fascism, communism, royal dictatorship. You can see it, you, you know it exists, you know you are not free. You have a focus for your suppressor, you can see him. And the desire for freedom in the human heart will eventually rebel against that form of control. We've seen it many times. Then there's the other kind. That's the prison within, with bars, you can see. Then there's the prison without the bars, the prison you can't see, where you are completely controlled, but you think you're free. And no one rebels against not being free when they think they are. And as, particularly in this century, but in America earlier than that, um, as these European empires, particularly the British Empire, rolled back on the surface out of these continents and out of these countries, they left out there the bloodlines and the secret society networks through which they operate, and they have continued to control those countries ever since. But now, because they can't see it, they can't touch it, they can't focus on it, it's very much more difficult to know it exists, therefore to expose it, therefore to remove it. Staggering as it may be to most people, not least to American people, America, United States, the superpower, has never been free. It's never been free from control from Britain and Europe, particularly Britain. If you want people to look in the opposite direction from where the power is, so they don't realize where the control is coming from, then you have to create a situation in which if the power's here, they're looking there. So now we have a situation in the world where everyone focuses on the United States as the superpower, the evil superpower, America. But America's being string pulled from Britain, where the image is, oh, Britain, you know. What a faded empire. It's a great empire, wouldn't you know, Britain? Yes. And now they just faded away. They're just a minor power, you know. That's what they want us to believe. And I'm not talking about Tony Blair's government here. Oh, bloody hell, no. I'm talking about the center of this Illuminati web that operates well beyond the level of governments. In 1776, or just after, the company that was created, headed by the British Crown, to run the American colonies, 